If you would turn in your Bibles this morning back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 beginning with verse 16. And I realize that we covered this verse uh, last week. This is where we ended last week. But I'm going to read verse 16 today because it does tie in with the verses that we will be uh, teaching from uh, today. And it uh, kind of gives us a tie in there. And it flows, kind of flows. Verse 17 kind of flows from verse 16. So that's why we're going to go ahead and read that again. And we will read down through the end of the chapter. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us at all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist, as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed, so that he might become the father of many nations, according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Now, we ended up last week, verse 16, as, as Paul, again, is building this case for justification by faith alone. And in verse 16 last week, and really ties in here with the very first part, this parent, little parentheses here in verse 17. In the last verse, he added the element of grace to show that justification was a work of grace and not of law, not of circumcision, not of any uh, work of man. And so his first statement in this verse, as it is written, I've made you a father of many nations, connects back to that last statement in verse 16 where he said, who is the father of us all, and really says this is how that he is the father of us all who are of faith. And that is tied to that promise there, back there, uh, back from Genesis, and that's what he's quoting here. This statement here in the first part of verse 17 comes from Genesis 17 and 5 and is, of course, and is, of course, part of the promise which God made to Abraham. Now, as said previously, as we've talked about previously, all those who are of faith are part of this promise. Everyone that is of Faith is of this promise that God made to Abraham that you will be a father of many nations. So therefore, truly, in a sense, he is called the father of us all in that sense. But now he says here, after stating that, in the presence of him whom he believed, God. Now the emphasis here is that Abraham, I think, received these promises in the presence of God. Abraham, if you notice, if you look back to Genesis, spent a lot of time literally in the presence of God. And I just want to kind of note here and look at these particular passages before we move on, before I make some additional comments here. In Genesis 12 and 7, we are told that the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. In chapter 15 of Genesis and in verse 1 it says, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. In verse 5 it says there that he, talking of God, he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. 
in chapter 17 of Genesis and verse 1. It says, when the Lord, I mean, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Chapter 18, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door of the heat of the day. Go to chapter 22. And there again, in verse 1, it says, It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And you go on down to verse 11, and it says that the angel of the Lord, when we believe that to be a theophany, of Christ, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, so he said, here I am. So we see this over and over again that God revealed himself to Abraham personally and was in the presence of Abraham personally. Now when you look at all of these passages, you see a man under whom I think that God probably revealed himself to Abram and Abraham more than anybody else. I believe that Abraham probably had more personal appearances of God in his presence than any other man in the scripture. Now Moses spent a lot of time with God up on Mount Sinai. But I believe that these were, in a sense, even more personal than what, than what Moses had. And so I believe he was blessed more than any other man in this way. Uh, to be in the near presence of God. And so how could Abraham, we talk about Abraham and the great life of faith that he lived, but how could he not have been transformed after being in God's presence so many times? Could you be in the presence of God like that and have God speak to you so many times like that and not be changed and not be transformed? And as I was thinking about this, you know, it spoke to me about this. It gives us an example of how we should strive to live in God's presence. You want to have the faith of Abraham? You want to live a life like Abraham? Then you expose yourself. You seek the presence of God. They say, well, isn't God everywhere? I mean, isn't he omnipresent? And in that sense, aren't we in God's presence all the time? I think you understand my meaning. It's different. There's a difference between just simply walking around and saying, oh, I'm, I'm out in the, you know, uh, I'm out in the presence of God today. Now, I think that there is a way in which we as believers, if we really want to walk with the Lord, we're going to have to seek the presence of God. Now, you know, how do we do this? I've got to thinking about this, and it's even for my own personal self, and it, and it causes reflection upon any pastor will tell you when he when he studies a passage of scripture to preach, that he gets preached to first, and he learns the lessons first. So how do we do this? How do we get into the presence of God? Now, God, I don't believe, is going to come down to me and speak to me like he did to Abraham. I don't think he's going to do that. But we do it, I think, in some very practical ways. We do it by being in the Word, you know. We do it by being in the Word of God. And as I was thinking about this, I thought about the 119th Psalm where really there what David writes is a glorying in the Word of God, in the law of God, in the commandments of God, and talking about how much he loves God's Word. You look at verses 15 and 16 of Psalm 119. He says, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your Word. I have never met anyone, I have never met anyone that exuded being in the presence of God that did not spend a lot of time in God's Word. You're not going to, to give the sense to others in your witness, in your testimony, in your walk that, that you've been in the, in the presence of God unless you get in the Word of God. And we need that. We need to do that. I think also when we touched on this somewhat in the Sunday school class, prayer. You are not going to really walk with God as you ought to if you, if you don't spend time in prayer. You know, and there, there, and there, are, there are two different kinds of prayer. And we talked about this even in the Sunday school class about there's private prayer. Do you have time alone with the Lord? Do you spend time with the Lord in the presence of God. And that's one way that you get in the presence of God is to get alone with God. And then there's also 
being in the presence of God when the people of God come together for corporate prayer. And that's, the, that's one of the things I think is greatly neglected, I believe, in believers. I think that's probably the most neglected thing in believers' lives is corporate prayer. And you're not going to be walk with God as the way that you should if you're not in prayer. And then worship. Worship. And I've already quoted that scripture this morning. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. You cannot walk with God. You cannot really live the Christian life if you are excluding yourself from the worship of the Lord and from the saints. And the most dedicated people I know, as far as the most faithful people that I know, are in God's house every opportunity they can be. They're not lax in their attendance to God's house. And so this is, these are some of the ways in which we, as believers, can be in the presence of God and show that we're walking with God. But Paul goes on to describe here the power of God who made these promises. He speaks here uh, about, about, these, about this God who made these promises to Abraham. He said, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, what is he meaning by this? Now, certainly, we saw in the Gospels Jesus' power in raising the dead, did we not? Three different times Jesus raised somebody from the dead. Then we also saw the, you know, we see and some have said, well, when he's talking about here, and cause those things which do not exist as though they did. And some say, well, he's talking there about the creation, that he spoke all things into creation out of nothing. And that is true. But I don't think that that's what Paul is talking about here. I think we should judge all scripture in context. I think in all likelihood, Paul is speaking in regards to God's dealings with Abraham and the promises that he is making here to Abraham. Now we read the scripture this morning over in Hebrews 11 and I, and I normally will read those scriptures on purpose. I have a purpose in that. And we see here what he talks about here that he says he gives life to the dead. Now how does that apply to Abraham? Well, If you look at Hebrews 11 and 12 it says therefore from one man and him as good as dead. So, well, Abraham wasn't dead when God was dealing with him, but he's talking about there in regards to Abraham being able to bring forth the seed to fulfill the promise that God had made to him. Now, let's think about this. Abraham was 99 years old here when God made this promise that we talk about over there, back over there in Genesis. He called him out at age 75. And 24 years passed, basically, before the promise was fulfilled. And in a sense, God had to do miraculous work there for Abraham and Sarah to be able to bring forth a child. Uh, you say, well, that was in biblical terms. I'm going to tell you something. That Even in biblical terms, back in Old Testament time, that was old to be having a baby. Now, It was a miracle. God quickened them. He quickened the womb of Sarah. He quickened uh, Abraham's ability to, to give a seed there that would, there would be a child born. God did a work there. And then this other phrase that he uses there, he call, calls those things which do not exist as though they did. I believe there he is talking about establishing a spiritual heritage that as yet did not exist. There was a spiritual heritage there that God promised to Abraham in being the father of many nations, but it didn't exist yet. And it wasn't until Isaac was born, until many years later, the fulfillment of that spiritual promise there, that that thing that did not exist, that spiritual seed that God promised to Abraham and him being a father of many nations, that that came to be. 
And I think that's what he's talking about there when he says cause those things which do not exist, that did not exist at that time, as though they did because God in his mind had already was going to fulfill that promise. It was sure in the mind of God that all these things would come to pass, that Abraham would be a father of the faithful through many nations. It's not just those that were the physical seed, the Israelites that were of the seed of Abraham, but Gentiles and Jews, all that would believe. And so uh, I believe that's what he, was, what he may, meant there. Then we move down to verse 18, where it says, Who contrary to hope, in hope believed. In the authorized version it says, Who against hope believed in hope. I believe that. Who against hope basically had faith in hope. Now from human reasoning and what seemed reasonable by human logic, what God promised Abraham was impossible. If anybody had come along, you know, and Abraham said, well, you know, I'm 99 and Sarah's 89 and we're fixing to have a baby. They would have said, that's ridiculous. You are out of your ever-loving mind. But Abraham still believed that promise. And God fulfilled that promise. And it seemed impossible. You think about this. As I already mentioned, it had been 24 years. Abraham was 75 when he was called from Ur of the Chaldees. He had reached 99 years old. The promise had not yet been fulfilled. But we know that the things that that, that which are impossible with man are possible with God is what it says in Luke 1 and 37. And in fact, in Genesis 18 and 14, the Lord said, Is anything too hard for the Lord? The God that created the world and everything that there is out of nothing, is it anything for him to overcome an 89-year-old womb? Could he not rejuvenate Sarah's womb so that she could conceive and make her body to where she could have a baby? Now, she lived for a while after that, but just think about that. It would probably be like in our time about like a 60, 65-year-old woman having a baby. Now, and <laughs> you know, I can imagine those of you that might have reached that age or approaching that age, you're thinking, oh, my word, what would that be like? But this was what happened. That God did this work in Abraham and in Sarah to fulfill his promise. And so he was tested for these 24 years. And even after when God commanded him to sacrifice Isaac, we know that he, he commanded him even after Isaac came. He said, I want you to sacrifice him. He was still convinced that God was going to fulfill the promise. He did not give up his hope. He still believed God in the midst of everything when probably it looked hopeless. Now, we all know that Abraham, during this time, he was not completely without fault. We understand that he and, he and Sarah got desperate, and Sarah said, well, you know, here, take Hagar, my handmaid, and conceive, and, and we're going to help God out here a little bit. Now that's what happens when you try to help God out. When you don't wait on God. They didn't wait on God and created a mess. That is still going on today in that. But for the most part, he was a faithful man. He still believed God. He was still convinced that God was going to fulfill his promises. He still believed that he would be the father of many nations. There. And he says there, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. And that's the same kind of faith that we're to have, is it not? Have you ever, you know, we talked about this this morning, about becoming discouraged in your faith. Do you ever get discouraged in your faith? If you say no, you're lying. You might as well be truthful. We all become scourged. I, I was you know, even last week I was discouraged, to tell you the truth. Be honest about it. I mean, you know, uh, most pastors every Monday morning they're discouraged. 
because they don't see the response to the word of God that they should. They're discouraged throughout the week because they're grieved over the, the faithlessness of the people that God has given them. And I don't know, you know, I, don't, I wonder how many pastors, I've talked to pastors before, and, and there's probably about 90% of them that want to quit on Monday morning or Sunday night. They're tested in their faith, but we're all tested in our faith. But the kind of faith that Abraham had is the same kind of faith that you and I have as the children of God. It is the kind of faith that God gives us to believe his promises toward us. It is the faith to believe that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. It's a faith to believe that his grace is sufficient in all of our trials. Do you think that Paul never got down and never got discouraged? Think about when he had that thorn in the flesh. He prayed, God, take this away from me. And we talked about it also in the Sunday school about how that he even despaired of life. Paul, I, was, I guess, got close to what Job said. Just let me die. God, I want to die. I'm just so despairing of life. I'm just so discouraged. Then God quickens that faith in his people. He doesn't leave them in despair. and He doesn't leave them in discouragement. He gives us that faith to believe that his grace is sufficient in all of our trials. He gives us the faith to believe that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. And the faith to believe that one of these days he's going to resurrect this body out of the ground and give us a new glorious body and be with him for eternity. Now there are a lot of people that say, well you're just, you're, you're foolish. You don't have good sense. Like they would have said to Abraham when he said, I'm going to have a baby. 99 years old. But we know by the Spirit of God put within us and the faith that God gives us, those the, that hope that we have is sure. It is steadfast. It is not a hope, hope so. It is a sure hope. It is an eternal hope. It is an everlasting hope that God gives to His people. It is that kind of faith. And I believe this, that the faith that God gives us is the same faith that he gave Abraham and that the faith that God gives his people is that they desire to look for a heavenly city whose builder and maker is God, the scripture says there. And our faith causes us to hope not in this life but in the life to come in a sense. And we live as we talked about in Ephesians 1. We have the heavenly blessings of God but we just don't possess them all yet. Not in reality. We will one day. Let's move down to verses 19 through 21. And it says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Now he points back to this thing about his body being already dead in regards to being able to be a father. But not being weak in faith. We all understand what it means to be weak. It means to be without strength. It means to be powerless. Now one of the things we understand about the aging of the human body is we're not as strong as we used to be. I ain't what I used to be. And now that I'm up in my mid-fifties, I realize I'm not what I used to be like 30 years ago. I'm tired at the end of the day when I work a full day. I don't recover like I used to. Uh, some of you young dudes in here, you can work a full day and Go home and rest for 30 minutes, and you're ready to go another eight hours. I do good to be able to be ready to go the next morning. <laughs> but he was not weak in his faith. Abraham was strong in his faith. His faith was tested. It says there that it looks there, he said, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. His faith was such that he knew God was able to do what his will had promised. 
even beyond the physical limitation of Abraham's and Sarah's natural capabilities. It's a good thing that God is not limited by our capabilities because he would be in sad shape as far as being able to do those things. But you think about what God has done and how he works in this world, how, what he has done through men and women. He, he doesn't pick out the smartest. He doesn't pick out the brightest. I mean, if he was going to do that, he certainly wouldn't have chosen those 12 apostles over there in the Gospels. He didn't choose them because they were the best and the brightest. That was just who he wanted to. He works his wonders. He fulfills his purposes and his promises through human instruments, but he is not limited by their weakness. He's not limited. God is not limited. I hear this thing said, oh, there's no hands in this world, but our hands, there's no feet in this world, but our feet. You know, that's, that's what God's hands and feet are, but that's not true. God works through those hands and through those feet, but he does it supernaturally. He's certainly not limited by that weakness. In fact, his strength is made perfect, the scripture says, in our weakness. I already made reference or allusion uh, to this particular passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 with Paul. There in verses 9 and 10, it says, and he, and you know, Paul was buffeted, he said, by a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. He said, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, he worked in the weakness of Paul to magnify his strength and his power. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul had spoken about over there that this is how God works. In chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, he says, Therefore you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And Paul, if you go down to chapter 2 there, said, when I, Brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with you of excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. You go down to verse 5, he says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I don't want you to be convinced of salvation by my persuasive argument. We want you to be convinced of your sin and your necessity of salvation by the power of God. By the word of God and the spirit of God working effectually together as the word of God is preached through men. What does he go on to say here? He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Giving glory to God. Did Abraham boast about his faith? No, he gave glory to God. He did not waver. His faith withstood the testings and the trials through all of the years. And let me say this. If you have real faith, it's going to be tested. It's going to be tested. It's going to be tried. There's no such thing as a Christian faith that has not been tested or will not be tested. It is going to be tried to show that it is true. Over in 1 Peter. Brother Wayne, I'm not going to expand upon this. I'll just read it. Because Brother Wayne's teaching tonight, so I don't want to, you know, tread on what he's going to say here. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. 
what does he say here? That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It's going to be tested. It's going to be tried. Abraham's was. There's going to be times of silence in your life when it really seems like God is not speaking to you personally. I mean, it doesn't mean that God is not there. It doesn't mean that God has left you. But it may be a time of testing. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to go through perhaps physical trials. You're going to have illness that's going to test your faith. You're going to go through financial trials trials that you know you may not really know if you're going to be able to pay the bills at the end of the month you may go through family trials when your family situation is tested your children may put you through some things your husband your your wife may put you through some things to try trials that will test your faith but if you're truly a child of God guess what you're going to come through that That faith is going to be purified. I don't. Th I don't. I have never seen a child of God who has truly been tested and come through the trial that their faith wasn't greater after the trial than it was before the trial. The truly faithful give glory to God even in the midst of their trials, even in the valleys. Psalm twenty-three. Yea, though I walk through the shadow. Of the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Some of you have been through some valleys, some dark valleys, even since you have become a believer. Isn't the sunshine sweeter on the other side of the darkness of the valley? Isn't your faith stronger after that you have come out of that valley, out of that trial, out of that testing of your faith. And it says that through all of this, it says in verse 21, and being fully convinced, fully persuaded that what he had promised, that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. The testing of Abraham's faith did not cause him to waver or be weak, but it convinced him that God was going to fulfill all the promises that he had made to him. All of the testings of your faith should prove to you that God is going to do what he has said. That he who has begun this good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. God's faithfulness to his people is not here one day and gone the next. If God the Father has begun a work of faith in you, that faith will persevere until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. They fail not. His faithfulness and His mercies do not fail. His grace does not fail. His promises never fail to His people. And what a great example this is to Abraham. We can look back at the life of Abraham and see that everything that Abraham went through and see that God fulfilled those promises to Abraham. And just as surely as He fulfilled those promises to Abraham, He will fulfill it to every single child of God. What a great witness and what a great testimony that God will perform this. It's not dependent upon me. Now, am I to be faithful to Him? Yes. Yes, I am. But the fulfillment of his promise to me concerning those eternal blessings is not dependent upon me. He's going to perform it. He's going to bring it to pass. The promise of God is that those that he has foreknown in the past 
calls in the present in the present are going to be glorified in the future. It's all going to come to pass. And he says there in verse 22, and therefore it was accounted to him, it was imputed to him for righteousness. But was it just for Abraham? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Guess what? It was for me. <laughs> if you're a child of God, guess what? It was for you. That promise that God made there, back there, way back there in Genesis chapter 12, was not just for Abraham. It was for David Weber. It was for Sissy Owen. It was for Felicia, for Felicia Canfield and Joy Connery and Chris Hudman and on and on and on and on we go. And James Weber, I better not leave my father out of this and my mama. It was for them, everyone that would ever come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That that righteousness would be imputed to us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ that trusted in His sacrifice for our salvation, for our sins. Because God was satisfied with that sacrifice that God made there. You can read Isaiah 53, it says that. Let me tell you something, if God was satisfied, nobody else needs to be satisfied. It was satisfied on my behalf. It says there in verse 24, the verse, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who had faith in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Do we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Absolutely. Not that I needed the proof, but my daddy went over there in 1967. Guess what? That tomb's empty. There's no bones there. But I didn't need that to know that Jesus had been raised from the dead. The fact that God moving in this world and sending his spirit into my dead soul is evidence to me that Jesus was raised from the dead. And when he gave me that faith and I believed in Christ, I believe that Jesus was alive. And he is alive. And he's seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father in heaven. And I know that beyond any doubt. Amen. Now that faith has been tested through the years. But guess what? I still believe it. I still believe it. And guess what? Every one of God's children that has that kind of faith, they're going to believe it till the day they die. Absolutely. That faith is not going to fail. You say, well, I've known some people that had faith and then they, they left the faith. Well, guess what? They never had the right faith. They never had God-given faith. Maybe they had daddy's faith. Maybe they had mama's faith. Maybe they had the church's or the preacher's faith. I don't know what they had, but if they quit, they didn't have the right kind of faith. Because the faith that God gives is everlasting. It perseveres to the end, therefore I shall persevere to the end. It says there that he was delivered up because of our offenses. He was nailed to that tree. He was put upon that cross. He shed that blood not for his offenses but for mine. Because of my lawlessness, because of my evil, because of my wickedness, because of my rebellion, he was put upon that tree and the nails were driven through his hands and his feet and he suffered unimaginably, unimaginable sorrow upon that cross because of my offenses. But praise God, he paid the price. He didn't try to pay the price. He paid the price. And God was satisfied of that. And it says he was raised because of our justification. And that's interpreted a lot of different ways. But I believe this. He was raised again to show I think God was satisfied. God was satisfied. The price of my justification was paid his resurrection is the promise 
that God was satisfied and that now the Holy Spirit would do He'd do his part and he would do that work in the hearts and the lives of his his people to bring about that salvation for which Christ had already paid the price. What a great passage of scripture. We rejoice in these things. That we serve a risen Savior. He's in... He say, it says in the world today, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's interceding for every child of God that here this, that's here this morning. He's interceding for every one of you. Every one of you. So Satan ever comes to accuse us before God, just like when he accused old Job, guess what? Except it's even better now. Because the price has been paid, the blood has been shed. Jesus can say, hey, mm. Just get out of here, boy. My blood's been shed for that one. You just go away. That's already been paid. That debt's already done. What a glorious, glorious thought. To think that we have a living Savior at the right hand of the Father who was raised because of our justification, who is there interceding for us, and that God the Father satisfied with what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Might I say this to any of you out there this morning that know that you do not have salvation, that you are outside of Christ. There is only one way of salvation. You know, I hear people argue about how much theology a person needs to know before they get saved. Here's the theology you need to know. You're a sinner. Jesus is the only Savior. That's the theology you need to know. That you need to flee to Christ and call upon Him. And I would urge you to do that today. To call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. To seek His face earnestly until you know Him in salvation. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we rejoice today in the testimony of Abraham because in many senses it is our testimony of how God called Abram out of a sinful life, how that Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. Lord, that's our testimony that you have called us as your children out of sinfulness and we have believed in you and your righteousness has been imputed to us. And we may not understand all there is to understand about that. We, we don't claim to, but Lord, we know the glorious truth is, is that God the Father is satisfied. We rejoice in this, the truth of these scriptures that, that show us that when you begin a work of faith, that it continues and it carries right on into eternity. Lord, and I pray today for those that are here this morning that are outside of Christ. Only you know who they are. And I pray this morning that you would do a work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts to bring them to the realization of their sinfulness and their need of you. In your name we pray. Amen. May we stand.